Hello everyone. Welcome to today's webinar at National Space Society Mumbai chapter. Uh, National Space Society aims towards creating a space faring civilization and spreading awareness regarding STEM and space in today's generation by providing them a platform to interact with experts in a field by means of webinar or talks. In today's session, we are honored and pleased to have Dr. Ravi Marga Sam sir, who is also the mentor for National Space Society USA Mumbai chapter. Uh, Dr. Ravi has uh, has completed his bachelor's in India in mechanical engineering and has served as a co-chair for ground safety review panel that ensures saf safety of all payloads and science experiments integrated at Kennedy Space Center, Florida, USA, on their way to International Space Station. After moving to United States, he continued higher studies, earning a master's of science aerospace engineering for for the past 25 years at NASA. Dr. Ravi has worked on many programs, uh, including Space Shuttle, Atlas, Delta, Titan, and many more, and the ISS too. And he is the one who has launched Kalpana Chawla to space aboard Space Shuttle Columbia with other fellow astronauts. He was responsible for transporting the Space Shuttle vehicle to the pad and getting it ready for the launch. He is also the NASA's international expert and scientist on rocket launch, including noise and vibration technology. In his career, he has supported over 100 plus missions of the space shuttle. And Dr. Ravi has also received uh, many awards during his 40 years of professional engineering career. He has been awarded with NASA's prestigious, prestigious Silver Snoopy Award for exceptional engineering and safety innovation on the space shuttle. Dr. Ravi is, is a VIP escort and an international public speaker at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. He has lectured over 30 plus countries around the world. He has served as an official Kennedy Space Center escort and provided technical and historical tours to astronaut families, foreigners, ambassadors, uh, government dig dignitaries, international visitors, and military officials. Over to you, Dr. Ravi, So, Okay, uh, thank you. NSS Mumbai, it's really a uh, great pleasure to be here back again, uh, giving a uh, talk about uh, rocket noise and vibration today. Uh, let's go with the NASA logo, the first uh, slide, and then uh, uh, put the second slide, uh, rocket noise, the title slide. Um, so basically, uh, today uh, the goal is to make sure that, that uh, you know, not everybody can become an astronaut. Uh, before that, I want to just uh, convey the message saying that this lecture is dedicated to my parents, uh, um, you know, who really gave me my education and where I am today. Um, can you roll the slides, I guess? Yes, sir, sure. Yeah. Go to the second slide, first and second slides. Um, so really, the purpose of this lecture today is, uh, 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 I, I want to, you know, we have very limited time. I'm going to show you a lot of slides, about 100 slides, but most importantly, I want the message today is to make sure that, you know, not everybody can become an astronaut, uh, uh, but, but, you know, you can become an astronaut maker. Next slide. Uh, it's important that, you know, uh, you study many, many areas of uh, work at Kennedy Space Center or any rocket uh, uh, facility. And most importantly, uh, there is very limited number of people who are experts in this field of rocket launch induced noise and vibration. And I was lucky to be part of that program for 100 launches from 1989 all the way to 2011 when the shuttle program ended. Next slide. Really, uh, what I want to impress upon you is uh, uh, some historical facts. I'll give you key uh, points in between so that you remember those points. It's very important. But uh, overall, this is the presentation outli outline. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because of the audience size and also the uh, quality of the audience, you know, because they are in different modes, students from all different walks of life. So I'm going to give you a big picture. Uh, next slide. Uh, NASA has been a global leader in space exploration. And, you know, my, I personally have sent probes all the way from Sun to uh, uh, Saturn and stuff like that, you know, in my own life. And I've seen things go to Pluto and uh, uh, beyond Pluto, basically, into the interstellar space. Uh, obviously, now, we are looking at uh, landing uh, uh, flying helicopters on Mars, which is very near and dear to me because I worked in helicopters before I came to NASA. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, it's important that you understand uh, that, that, yes, uh, Russia sent Sputnik, but really 
uh, if you look at the history of uh, uh, space program after 1958, many, many uh, space vehicles were derived by NASA. So NASA has been a leader, not only in designing rockets, but launching rockets to moon. We are the only country, the only agency in the world which has landed on Mars eight times and stuff like that. But rockets, next slide, uh, rockets have been there for uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years. Chinese started the rockets. But more importantly, I just want to impress upon you that uh, when Abdul Kalam, who I was escorted uh, many, many times uh, at Kennedy Space Center, he was poor. He, he had come to NASA and he saw <clears throat> some pictures of Tipu Sultan's uh, warriors fighting the British in uh, in the battle in South India. And these same uh, 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 rockets were modified by the Chinese, from the Chinese, but then they were made into a metal case. So there was a lot of innovation there, even by Tipu Sultan. And then the same rockets were taken over by the British and they were bombing America when they tried to take over America, basically. And that's why when you hear the National Anthem of America, it says uh, rockets red glare. That red glare comes from really uh, the original Tipu Sultan's rocket. So India has some credibility there in terms of rockets. Next slide. So here we are looking at uh, Sputnik. Yeah, it started uh, uh, October 1957, changed the whole thing uh, uh, about uh, going to space. Now, you know, if a man could send a small uh, a probe to space, a small ball, then he can uh, launch a rocket to, to not only destroy the world, but also we have to predict the world against rockets. So that's why there was a space race going on between India and America. Next slide. Uh, so really, uh, if you look at NASA, you know, we have landed on the moon six times, gone to Mars about eight times, sent probes all, all over the universe, as I said earlier. Uh, we also looked at pale blue dot, uh, which is what uh, Carl Sagan, one of the famous astronomers, talked about uh, uh, in Mother Earth, basically. So we have looked at Mother Earth from far away, but also up close, you know, we have taken pictures of from moon to earth, you know, and which is amazing on Apollo 10, that is the Apollo 10 shot. Then obviously, uh, I myself have launched the windows to the universe, as we call it, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, it is an amazing journey for me to be a small boy from Mumbai, Malund in fact, and not knowing anything about space program when John F. Kennedy died. And doing all this is amazing. So the message here is, you know, anything is possible, nothing is impossible. Next slide. So really, uh, what my uh, topic today is uh, Space Shuttle. It's a cathedral of technology from 1981 to 2011. It is one of the finest machines. I, I, it's like we, I call it the Pushpak Vimana of uh, India, basically. You know, when we had the Pushpak Vimanas. It's an amazing technology. It will never be duplicated. And I don't know why I, I got a chance to come to NASA and work on the program. Uh, I have no idea. And same thing. You know, me and another person, Kalpana Chawla, we came on separate journeys. I came to America before her. I came in 75, she came in 82, but our my journey joined in 1988 and uh, uh, rest is history, as you know. I got to launch her as the first Indian woman to space. And then, yes, it's the second time, you know, we lost her. Uh, next slide. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, shuttle made it possible for humankind to live and work in space. We'll talk a little bit about how important it is living and working in space and how we monitor the Earth and stuff like that. It is very important to monitor Earth from space, you know, because we cannot just walk over every single nook and corner of the world to see what is there and what is not there. Next slide. Living and working in space is very, very expensive. Rocket thrust is uh, uh, when it comes to payload costs about $10,000 per pound, a bottle of water costs about $10,000. So it's very, very expensive. So uh, uh, rocket launching is not only dangerous, but but it's also very expensive. So, and living and working in space, we have done that about 20 years now on the ISS. I was again lucky to not only build the entire ISS uh, uh, as a part of the NASA program, but also send about 400 payloads from Japanese mice all the way to alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is worth about a $5 billion machine, uh, which is sitting on the ISS. Next slide. So here is a beautiful picture of uh, the Kennedy Space Center. This is pad A. This is a historic pad A where Neil Armstrong went to the moon. And we have two pads like this, pad A and pad B. It's called 39A and B. And those are the historic landmarks. Uh, uh, and 
uh, I was in charge of both pads, including all the structures on the pad. Next slide. So really, uh, when we talk about uh, the launch pad, this is a beautiful picture of the space shuttle. Atlantic Ocean is in the far back. Uh, there is a lot of uh, lagoons and stuff like that. This is a beautiful pad. This co itself costs right now about 10 to $15 billion to make it. Uh, uh, Someday we'll talk a little bit about the shuttle processing and I can talk more about uh, how we build the pad and other things. But this exactly whatever you see up there is worth about 15, 20 billion dollars. And we were, I was lucky to be in charge of systems engineer on the launch pad to look at every single aspect of it to make sure, you know, we walk around and put the shuttle together and launch the rockets. And 100 rockets I launched, not a single failure. Next slide. So here's a beautiful comparison of the Apollo 11 on the left side and uh, the space shuttle. You know, they're different uh, birds as we call it. Uh, Apollo 11 was historic. You know, it was, its purpose was different. Where a shuttle could put 50,000 pounds of payload or 25,000 kilos and send seven astronauts to space, which not many people can do it. Next slide. So, you know, as the rocket lifts off, it generates intense acoustics. When I say uh, intense acoustics, I'm talking about 193 decibels. It's a continuously man-made sound, which nobody has done it except, except the rockets. Uh, so basically, this uh, sound, next slide, uh, it, this sound is very, very interesting that, you know, it doesn't care uh, uh, where it wants to go. Once we lift off from the launch pad to clear the top of the tower, which is about 100 meters or 150 meters, it takes about six seconds. So you're going from T0 or T minus zero, which is a liftoff to T plus eight minutes. I'm uh, already in space at Mach 25. You know, that's how fast we go. But this rocket noise, as I said, goes everywhere. It goes into the electronics. It goes into the handrails, vibration of structures, cable trays, blast load, many, many, many problems. It also, uh, there's a ground vibration, which goes about three miles actually. So acoustics is fine, great but it can be a nuisance also, and nothing you can do about controlling the acoustics. Next slide. So, you know, here's, uh, you know, here's why we need to study the rocket noise and vibration, because uh, structural vibration is definitely a consequence of the air and structure bone noise. 192 plus decibels, amazing. I mean, nobody else, nobody in the, in the world can produce that in the lab, okay? How do you test something like, you know, that kind of, load to a structure basically because you know if you don't test it you'll break the things so in the end what i want to impress upon you is one last line there resonance okay that's the most fundamental thing resonance is basically a study of sound and vibration where you are using the frequencies the mode shapes and the damping of the structure to understand how two structures behave so sound generated go will go and impact the structure and uh, the structure starts vibrating now the sound has a frequency and the, and also it has a, a mode shape and this mode shape and the structures mode shape when they uh, go, get together and they amplify the signal then we be going to full resonance something like that you know basically it would be something like a uh, 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 you know machine or a pump in your house which is vibrating like crazy because it has gone into resonance uh, next slide uh, so basically uh, you have a force which is the acoustic force then you have the structure where the structure may be a rocket itself, the humans inside the rocket or the launch pad structures, they are the structures and the rock, uh, force goes and hits that. And when it hits that, that's when we get into vibration. Next slide. So many, many effects of uh, sound and vibration. You know, you have me mechanical fatigue to uh, shock loads. Uh, we have pyrotechnic problems in space. We could have payload failures. We could have spacecraft failures and not only that we lost columbia and challenger and i think in my opinion they were more related to a vibroacoustic failures at liftoff and so many many times uh, next slide it's uh, important to understand what happens this is the on the right side you see the first flight of sts uh, uh, one which is the space shuttle one mission in uh, 1981 and it created almost a 40 foot crack on the mobile launcher that mobile launcher itself is about three inches, four inches thick steel, solid steel, and it make, broke it. So in the back where the uh, person is sitting, you see a small uh, a vertical column. That's where we call it the 
you know, uh, that's where we put water on the launch pad. You know, we put about 300,000 gallons of water. The next slide. Uh, basically, uh, the shuttle is made out of a lot of, lot of these thermal tiles because it is a vehicle which takes off like a rocket but lands like a plane. So basically, we wanted to protect it as it enters the atmosphere. And these are thermal tiles made out of silica, foam or sand basically. And uh, they can sustain up to 3000 degrees temperature. And a lot of times in the first launch, we lo lost about maybe 100 uh, of those uh, tiles falling off in, from different places. Next slide. Uh, not only uh, we have acoustic problems uh, on the tiles, but also on the back where the three main engines are, you see, uh, we have a foam shedding problem. The red line on the rocket uh, uh, on the right side, that's where uh, STS-107, we had the Kalpana Chavlas launch. The foam from the external tank, which is the orange tank, came and hit there, and we had a big problem, basically, and that led to the failure. Next slide. So basically, you know, you can see the beautiful picture of the main uh, rocket engines uh, uh, running here on the right side. Uh, you know, you, you can literally, you know, we have 1000 tubes running inside that uh, rocket nozzle, which use liquid hydrogen to cool it. And literally that dumbbell or the nozzle should break, you know, and you'll see in a minute how it uh, breaks and I mean, uh, behaves in, in a vibration mode. It has what they call as nodal diameter. And it's very, very, interesting to see that why that doesn't fail because of how nasa engineers designed uh, the the, uh, uh, the the rocket engine uh, to make sure that they pour liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen through that and you can see the dumbbell deforming right now and on the left side you'll see how the thermal tiles are protecting the shuttle from landing uh, du during landing basically let's go to next slide so as i said many many parts of the back of the engine also, we had what they call as uh, stringer uh, or metal cracks, fatty cracks, uh, just because of the rocket noise. But rocket noise also affects, next slide, it also affects uh, what is below the rocket uh, uh, launch pad. Here's a rocket, uh, you know, a substation just below the rocket launch pad. And, you know, this whole substation is below the ground in basic uh, about 60,000 cubic feet of concrete, but still it vibrates like crazy. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you know, it's uh, very important to understand that not only rocket influence, uh, rocket noise influences what is happening on the ground, but when you go into space, we have what they call as max Q, which is about three uh, uh, minutes after the liftoff. And that's where Columbia accident and Challenger accident happened around 70 seconds after liftoff. Uh, Columbia uh, problem came during landing, whereas Challenger happened because of the o-ring problem right at liftoff because of vibroacoustic problems and you can on the right side you can see uh, uh, the fog coming over the rocket engines that is the highest amount of aerodynamic pressure coming on the rocket so we slow down the rocket so that we can make sure that the rocket doesn't shear off you know the wings of the rocket doesn't shear off next slide so basically the rocket not only affects uh, the structures on the launch pad but we have many 5000 alligators at kennedy space center I don't need any uh, real guards, you know, they are the, our guards really. We have birds and animals and stuff like that. A lot of times these birds, uh, uh, you know, cannot reproduce or uh, have a problem hearing and other things. And a lot of times the environmentalists would come very hard on us saying, hey, Dr. Ravi, move the launch pad away. I said, no, no, I can't move the launch pad away. You have to move your birds away, you know, stuff like that, things like that. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So really, you know, uh, people ask me, you know, does a baseball bat or a cricket bat, does it deform? Yes, you know, every single thing in this universe has what they call as normal modes of um, vibration, basically. In this case, the baseball bat has the first uh, fundamental or the first frequency of uh, vibration at 179 hertz. The second one is at 582. So each structure, you can uh, check it by looking at the uh, analysis and you know, uh, be, even before you launch a rocket, you know what is the vibrational structure of the rocket engine, basically. Next slide. So, you know, not only uh, the, the uh, rocket gen noise generates structural resonance, but it affects the astronauts also. So we have to protect the astronauts. As you know, the astronauts are sitting way up on top, about 80 to 100 feet above the nozzle of the rocket engine. And this, 
uh, helps them because the sound is traveling at a very low speed. That's the best part of uh, sound compared to light, which travels very, very high speed, whereas sound travels only about 340 meters per second or 43 meters per second or 1100 feet per second. So the rocket is lifting off very fast. The sound is trying to catch up, so it cannot catch up. That's the only reason uh, why these astronauts are really uh, 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 survive. They survive the launch, and you see the astronaut on the left side. We have a lot of issues with uh, the head resonance and resonance of many many uh, issues. Uh, the whole body resonance is there at uh, maybe three to ten hertz and stuff like that. And then you have the head and neck resonance around twenty to thirty hertz. Eyeballs. Uh, they resonate at about 60 to 90 hertz. The skull resonates around 100 to anywhere 300 hertz. Uh, but, you know, even one, uh, one hertz or one cycle per second energy can affect it. And the rocket generates anywhere from one hertz all the way to uh, 1,000 to 2,000 hertz. So we have, the noise has all kinds of frequencies. And so really we cannot escape from noise. Next slide. So not only noise affects human uh, psychology, but it, uh, it's similar to what we call the ocean waves. You know, when, oh, if you go to the beach, you will see ocean pat uh, the beach pattern uh, making different uh, wave structures because sometimes the waves of the ocean are big or small. So it is similar to that. Next slide. Uh, even resonance is created by somebody singing very loud and it can break a glass because the uh, uh, first um, a bending mode of the glass is uh, similar to the rocket, I mean, uh, to the sound coming and hitting it. So when they join together, they explode and they create what they call as resonance. So for every th single structure in the world, resonance is very critical. So this is one of the most fundamental things of acoustics and vibration. If you can understand this system, you can go and work in any industry you want and become highly successful. Next slide. So basically, when we talk about uh, rockets, even rollout fatigue, I'm taking uh, this structure on the left, you see, is, I was in charge of all this, the rocket, the mobile launcher, which is the top part of the rocket behind where, where I'm standing, and the bottom part is called the crawler transporter. We'll talk about it someday. Um, but what I want to impress upon you is, uh, you see the structure in the back. The bottom structure is about 6 million pounds or three million kilos, okay? The top part is nine million pounds or about four and a half million kilos. The rocket is another three million pounds or one and a half million kilos. So, you know, imagine nine million kilos, I'm moving three miles or four and a half, five kilometers from my office to the launch pad. How do you build a how, road and a structure and stuff like that to, to move something like this? And that's why what happens is the small vibrations coming from the rocket at uh, even 0 0.01 hertz or 100 of a cycle per second uh, frequency goes through the whole structure although it, it is a 20, uh, 10 million pounds i mean 20 million pound structure uh, it still goes through that and affects my rocket next slide so uh, when Werner von Braun started the space program for NASA in uh, on the Apollo program he wanted to make sure that you know, the rockets, uh, we understand the entire rocket. So he not only asked us to study uh, the whole structure body, whole body structure of the uh, rocket. So really we had to literally uh, uh, hang the uh, Apollo Saturn V rocket in my office and, you know, pull it from the bottom and push it from the top, trying to generate and excite so that we understand what is the natural frequency of the structure. So when the acoustics or sound is generated, it doesn't affect the rocket, basically. Next slide. So uh, we not only can do that now uh, with the technological innovations, with finite element analysis, I can do that right here in my office, even before I launch a rocket. And you can see on the left uh, how the rocket is bending, basically. That's a bending mode of uh, one of the rockets called Aries 1X. So all these tests, tests can be done on the computer. But what we cannot do is simulate something like 190 decibels. Next slide. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, there is tremendous amount of noise measurement challenges, 190 plus decibels, 100 G vibrations. It is impossible to survive in that environment. If I'm standing on the launch pad at rocket liftoff, my body will be uh, in, uh, thrown out into millions of pieces, basically. 
uh, thermal environment is very high temperatures. Uh, obviously, we have sensors we have to put. Next slide. So really, with all these challenges, uh, we we also want to understand what is the uh, time aspect of sound, you know, when the ignition happens, when the characteristics of transients happen, and when we have the liftoff of the rocket, you know. And uh, so basically, that helps us, uh, the next slide, it helps us to understand the vibration pattern. This is for the space shuttle, not for the Apollo, because uh, Apollo is a little bit different rocket. It's a liquid, a liquid rocket. Whereas Apollo, I mean, shuttle was a liquid solid rocket. So here you can see the liftoff time about six seconds. Then you have the transonic uh, flight uh, when you go into from subsonic to supersonic and then max Q, which is the maximum aerodynamic pressure. So this is the realm of the vibroacoustics engineer. If you understand this first three minutes of rocket launch, I can guarantee you Elon Musk or anybody, ISRO or anybody in the world will guarantee uh, get your job immediately, you know, uh, to help them out, basically. This is the most difficult part, and there are very, very few people. Even in NASA, there are only one, in, uh, in, in Kennedy Space Center, there were only two or three people who understood this kind of things because we had studied 100 launches. Next slide. So uh, a little bit about what I learned from understanding where the uh, rocket uh, sound mixing region comes and where is the subsonic part and the supersonic part and where is the noise generated so next slide what we found out was you know you see this fluctu fluctuating mass flow noise and then the lip noise but most importantly the noise comes from not only shock turbulence but Mach wave radiation that is where the noise generated which goes and hits many many structures on the launch pad next slide now the noise uh, generated it has acoustic efficiency based on the thrust of the rocket. So bigger the rocket, more thrust, you know, basically. So uh, it also depends on what kind of acoustic efficiency, you know, uh, you use, uh, whether you have 100% thrust and the uh, rocket efficiency may be 50%, something like that. So you need to understand that part to see how much of my uh, thrust energy is converted from uh, rocket thrust because of the liquid rocket engine like uh, uh, liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen and solid rocket boosters uh, and typically if the rocket weighs about four million pounds or two million kilos you need about one and a half million kilos more to lift it off the ground and go into space just a uh, rule of thumb about one million kilo more than the thrust and all this thrust energy uh, the bigger the rocket more the thrust and more the thrust, more the acoustic energy. So next slide. So we need to catch up with a lot of running around here. Uh, noise during SSME ignition, it's a loud roar, uh, a lot of vibrations, uh, like you are driving a car on the railroad track, basically. Uh, you know, it's very, very uh, uh, loud and uh, rattling. And this uh, starts immediately at T minus six and a half seconds at liftoff. And the shuttle is still sitting on the launch pad. At T0 is when we light the solids, and that's when we say Hail Mary, you cannot stop the rocket. But when you start the main engines, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen engines, I can stop the rocket at least even like I have stopped it T minus one second before liftoff. It's very dangerous business. If you make one tiny mistake and light, light the solids and the rocket no, doesn't want to go anywhere, we have a big hole in the ground or the rocket is going somewhere and hitting somebody. So next slide. So uh, basically, uh, sounds during SRB ignition, you know, that is, uh, uh, sorry, go back one. Uh, noise during uh, SRB ignition, SRB is the worst thing. Once you light, it's Hail Mary, you are going somewhere, whether you like it or not. And this is the most dangerous part because that's what happened to uh, uh, Challenger accident. Next slide. So basically, these vibrations and acoustics, they increase up to Mach 1, which is a transonic and then from there, uh, we have a SRB separation about 20, uh, T plus two minutes, 25 miles up in space. Then uh, we throw away the SRBs and now the rocket is more light only, the liquid engines are there. We go up to eight and a half minutes and we are in space already. So you are going from T zero, zero minutes at liftoff, rocket is sitting on the ground, but then in eight and a half minutes, we are in space, uh, traveling at 25 Mach or 17,500 miles per hour. So it's amazing, amazing speed here. You know, we are talking about. Uh, 
so sound doesn't travel in vacuum as you know we have eb when we do eba we use radios and other things um uh in the shuttle inside it's the air is the same as uh, our own air atmosphere on the ground so we don't have to worry about next slide so here is where the columbia accident happened uh, on january 28th you know because of the o-ring problem again uh, we, we we you know our rocket launching i uh, tell people it's not like launching uh, 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 you know flipping burgers or flipping pizza you know i mean you have to put your 100% 200% 1000% on the job to make sure everything is going right uh, next slide if you don't do this you know you lose your family basically you know these are our family we lost on uh, challenger in uh, 1986 at that time i was working for boeing company i was not part of the nasa program yet i came in 1988 89 so again i still uh, saw the uh, lift went off and uh, accident so i still take responsibility uh, next slide uh, now this is the tragic accident of kalpana chawla uh, this is the second flight sts 107 in 2003 uh, the first flight went very successful and she became the first indian woman in space and as part of uh, the program uh, i saw her one minute before she went to the launch pad and she was a commoner from there she became an astronaut within a matter of uh, uh, less than 3 hours uh i also made arrangements with uh, indra kumar gujral who was uh, our prime minister at that time and she talked to him in space as soon as you know we reached space uh but a beautiful rocket which we, uh, which is about 5 billion dollars and look what happened on the right uh, corner uh, you, you see 200,000 parts coming back which is a very very sad day when you walk around that uh, hangar there that day i, I literally cried because just about 10 days ago i had launched her in space on columbia uh, both launches were on columbia in, incidentally next next slide so uh, we as you know the foam uh, from the what they call as uh, orange tank it came and hit the leading edge of the rocket and made a, a spin hole a, a little bit bigger hole and from there the plasma went through there and you know that led to the break up during landing because uh the heat went through the uh, one of the wings and then it turned upside down and literally burnt uh, uh the whole thing next slide so here we are talking about uh, uh you know loss of crew you know this is you know uh, people can say we have many astronauts but you know you can't lose even one astronaut you know uh, that's a bad day for you you know i can claim that okay it didn't happen during my time because i launched a rocket i'm in charge of launching not landing landing people are different but we are part of the family we are part of the program so it hurts so even today it hurts you know uh next slide so uh because of that accident i became more diligent about uh, uh how we have to work with uh, launch pad uh, problems and this was one of the cases when on sts 124 mission you can google that Uh, and on the left side you can see two pads beautiful pads and then we have two rockets on the right side here uh, sts 124 next slide we lost about uh, hundreds of bricks 3000 bricks on the uh, wall basically uh, this is a lift off of the rocket uh, next slide uh, this is the uh, flame trench you see in the white on the bottom uh, on the one of the sides of the flame trench uh, we we did lose about 3000 bricks and uh, i was very concerned after this launch because sts 125 the next mission was a hubble repair mission and it was the last repair mission after that we were not going to repair the hubble and that was a very important mission because it, it extended the life of hubble and hubble has done wonders to understanding the, the far away universe basically next slide uh, so one of the things we do also is put water bags you can see on the right side Uh, red bags uh, what that uh, does is as the sound is generated by the uh, solid rocket boosters it goes through this water bags and the water is spilled in the meanwhile we are putting 300000 gallons of water which makes uh, the sound a little bit less but once we lift off from the pad and uh, once we are off the pad even one one second uh, uh, that's a trick question for you when do you become an astronaut you became an astronaut when not because you know uh, you you nasa hired you know uh, you become an astronaut when you lift off on your rocket power even 1 inch or 1 millimeter of the pad 
with, with the rocket power. That's when you become an astronaut. So next slide. I want to show you the picture of where the problem came on the uh, side of the wall. You see many, many damages, a bigger picture. Next slide. So this was a big concern for NASA. You know, if this uh, brick went and hit the rocket, it would be a very bad day for NASA. So we did many, many studies. Next slide. We did uh, CFD studies trying to understand how the uh, ignition over pressure peak or rocket exhaust comes and what kind of temperature, pressure, uh, uh, velocity it has. You know, there were some of the bricks were going at Mach 1, Mach 2, you know. So that's a tremendous amount of speed. And when Kalpana Chawla's rocket got hit with a foam, which is not even a few pounds, that was hit at a few hundred miles per hour. Here we are talking about, you know, in excess of Mach 1, you know. So next slide. So we did a diligent study. Uh, uh, I almost lost my job because uh, the uh, manager in charge of uh, the study, uh, uh, she didn't want to put uh, some sensors on the launch pad. Next slide. We'll go to the next slide. So uh, this is the flame trench where I am. You can see the top two holes. That's where the solid rocket booster exhaust comes. And the uh, one in the back, that's where the main engine exhaust comes. And uh, to your le my left, uh, that's where the damage happened. So you can see the big size of the uh, flame trench or the flame deflector, as we call it. And uh, basically, uh, this is, uh, 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 I was uh, telling NASA managers to put some sensors there. Unfortunately, there were no sensors available. So what, I, what would happen is, uh, you know, uh, the, the, we had a big fight. Finally, they put the sensors. I almost lost my job. and had a heart attack and had a quadruple bypass. So my, there's a big scar on my body. <laughs> so um, that's a proof I'm telling you that because it's important that, you know, when you uh, uh, believe in something, go after it, you know, with full heart because rocket launching is not just uh, launching burgers or uh, flipping burgers, basically. It is the most dangerous job in the world. Next slide. Uh, I think we are coming out to a little bit of time uh, crunch here, so I have to run with the slides. Uh, there's an erosion pattern here. Uh, next slide. There is a, a flame trench. Next slide. Uh, the, the, uh, some flame uh, deflector uh, sensors we put in here. Next slide. Uh, we did almost a million dollars worth of uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics models on how this rocket model does. Uh, plume flows through. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, we uh, this is the water uh, suppression system. This is the 300,000 gallons of water. So when the Swadesh movie was shot in Kennedy Space Center and Rahul, uh, um, uh, Shah Rukh Khan and Ashutosh Gawarikar came to visit me, I was their tour guide, and we made a display for them. This is about 300,000 gallons per minute. So we run it for about three minutes, 300,000, I mean, 900,000 gallons of water here. That's how much we put. Uh, next slide. So... You know, uh, when you do the analysis, you have to understand, think of possibilities. So if I can't put, uh, study the main structure, then what we did was, if you see at the right side of the picture, you can see a, a small stick. There is a, a tiny structure I put on the launch pad, which really uh, simulates the main structure. So really, because people wouldn't let me put sensors on the main launch pad, I put it my own structure. So this is the first time in the history of NASA uh, they let us put our own structure. So uh, there are many fuss one can do uh, if you are diligent and try to see, innovate in your own ideas. Next slide. Uh, he, here is uh, another uh, aspect of uh, engineering I want to impress upon you is that, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, you, you just don't try one thing, you know. The one thing doesn't work, you will try many, many possibilities. It's called possibilities thinking, you know. And uh, because we couldn't uh, uh, do the testing with 190 decibels. Uh, we cannot, first of all, we cannot generate that kind of sound in the lab. Secondly, nobody is going to let me uh, test that on my on a launch pad structure because it will break even before I launch. So my plan was to come up with a subset. That means I can study my own structure because I can define that structure in terms of uh, 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 vibration and sound and put some sensors on there. So we had to put the sensor about uh, 100 meters away from the launch pad because on the launch pad, getting wires and cables and putting uh, sensors, acoustic microphones or vibration sensors uh, is very difficult because 
they can fly away and hit a rocket one time we had a big uh, uh, camera cover which uh, just took off with vibroacoustics and just uh, took out about 10 feet section of a concrete wall which is about three feet thick you know it just broke into pieces basically uh, many times uh, we have lost uh, you know some of the structures on the launch pad uh, we uh, had a big problem on the um, mobile launcher where we had a 40 foot crack um, we not only had uh, issues with that but then we lost that bricks you know those are three major bricks uh, major problems but there are many many tiny problems because we have a lot of lot of fuel uh, uh, pipes you know on the launch pad which are really uh, creating a lot of problem so i have some stories on the right side here uh, sometimes you know we have alligators landing uh, sleeping on the uh, on the on the runway when the shuttle is landing so we send our uh, uh, fire engine people to with cold water ice water and throw them out we have 5000 alligators at kennedy space center a lot of times you know birds die as the shuttle lifts off the birds die they sh stop hearing or they don't reproduce like the fish even sonic boom is a problem even uh, I, I lived in, in Orlando, uh, about 60 to 100 kilometers away, and my house would shake when, when this, uh, the sound of the sonic boom came through. Uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about a woodpecker and owl story, but uh, even like, you know, every time if you go and look at the history of uh, space program, a lot of failures happened because uh, there was a vibroacoustic failure at liftoff. And this is, I'm talking about going back historically and even today uh, if you look at some of the people who are launching rockets um, many of the people you know if you find the root cause that is uh, definitely related to you know, a problem with the uh, what do you call uh, uh, vibroacoustics and our lift off uh, sound so now if i cannot test uh, my uh, acoustic uh, uh, you know knowledge on the main structure then i come up with a subset or a small uh, scale structure uh, next uh, next slide so this is how you work on a problem basically if you can test it then we have a lot of sensors if you look at the sensor on the left side it doesn't have any wires so we kept the sensor far away from the rocket so at least we could get data without uh, benefit of uh, having wires getting burned off or whatever during lift off so you have to come up with alternative methods next slide so if that didn't work so i came up with a rocket launching facility so this was like a flat pole as you see on the right uh, basically you put a small rocket on the horizontal bar there and uh, uh, that particular rocket uh, uh, nozzle it moves horizontally but also it is connected to this big flat pole and it can move vertically up and down so literally this is a xy plane you can simulate any trajectory for some rockets which lift off vertically and then some lift off horizontally I mean, uh, some lift off uh, parabolically, you know. Uh, so basically, you have different types of uh, rocket uh, 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 lift off scenarios, you know, you can, uh, any trajectory you can simulate basically. So, you know, we had the main testing done on the main rocket uh, launch pad. Then we have a subset, which we call the, uh, you know, uh, simulated the structure on the launch pad. Now we are doing these tests in the lab, you know. So there is three ways to attack the same problem. That's what I wanted to impress upon you. Next slide. So uh, this is a liftoff, uh, looking at uh, some of the vibrations. This is, uh, uh, unfortunately, there's no sound here, but you can see the far away rocket, uh, vib you know, lifting off and some of the astronauts sitting inside the rocket. This get about three Gs basically. Um, so it is very important that we understand what kind of uh, uh, vibration behavior not only the rocket sustains because rocket is no good if you can't lift off the pad, you know, basically. You know, you can have the best payload in the world like the Hubble or uh, the ISS, but if it can't lift off the pad and, you know, if, had, if it fails at lift off on the pad, you know, you can launch Perseverance rover all day, all night to Mars. It's not going to do your job because it has failed right at lift off. So that's where the vibroacoustics part comes into picture. Because don't forget this, each launch of this rocket shuttle cost me half a billion, $500 million per launch. One day delay was about a million dollars. So and going to Mars is like nine months, seven month journey and Perseverance rover vibrates like crazy. And now we have Ingenuity helicopter sitting under the belly of 
perseverance if it had vibrated at lift off would be uh, it would not fly in space so uh, with that what we did was we started developing new technologies without wires so now this is the rfid technology i uh, developed to measure the sound without this uh, you know benefit of wires and you can transmit the data anywhere so next slide so basically we, we had to when it comes to rfid we had to test the rfid structure on a small simulated structure and understand what is the time of arrival of the data from wherever the rocket lifts off because we are not allowed to stay within three mile radius of the rocket launch pad or almost four and a half five kilometers we have to be far away because nasa was always afraid that something may happen to the people if the rocket blows up just like in the case of challenger we have to study the shape of the acoustics and vibration signature we understand the frequencies now we can do all that into uh, put it into a finite element analysis a math model or whatever and apply the uh, psds or power spectral densities so the technology was not there in the apollo days but now i can take a, a time history of uh, take a acoustic microphone uh, i mean vibration and uh, and a, a, a microphone which produces sound i mean measures sound and vibration which measures the vibration of the structure uh, accelerometer and we can compare these two so because uh, the technology of fft fast fourier transform changed so we can take the time domain data into frequency domain so understanding time domain is very complex because uh, uh, rocket noise is just like earthquake wind loads uh, water loads uh, things like that it is random and non stationary it is impossible to understand how it behaves next slide so uh, next slide, please. yeah. So basically on the left side, you can see how the rocket lifts off and what kind of rocket profile, sound profile you have on the top and the bottom it's a vibration profile. So we made sure that we understood how uh, uh, the launch pad data compares with our far field data. Near field is maybe 100 meters from the launch pad. Far field is about, maybe about uh, uh, 1000 meters from the launch pad, something like that. Next slide. So we not only understood what the uh, mode, uh, I mean frequencies of the structures, these are the fre uh, frequencies in a static test of uh, this particular small scale structure. On the right, it is the, the frequencies measured by the liftoff or the data generated by the rocket. Next slide. A very close comparison between a modal test, which is you do the test in the lab for a structure, uh, Again, model test, you take a hammer and hit it and then measure the data. But you know, for big structures like rockets uh, on the launch pad, like Apollo or shuttle, you can't do that. You know, So these are small scale structures we could simulate in the lab. And the idea was to take the data, learn from small scale structures and apply the same knowledge on the big structure. Because on the big structure, we have two problems. First of all, I can't put sensors. Second of all, I can't measure the data because some areas where I want to measure the sensors will burn off. The third problem is it generates so much acoustics that uh, uh, that kind of load, uh, 193 decibels, I cannot reproduce in the lab. So how do you test something, you know, uh, uh, which you can when you cannot uh, do uh, or simulate in the lab? Like you know, good example would be something like a Perseverance uh, a rover with the helicopter, right? Ingenuity helicopter. You know, we can take the helicopter and apply some of the launch loads and stuff like that. We can apply some of the, uh, in vacuum, we can fly the helicopter, things like that. But that's all we can do. But real test is the first time on Mars, basically. And anything can go wrong. And the same thing, you know, on the rocket launch pad, it's impossible to simulate anything. Next slide. So uh, basically, uh, you know, we, we as a vibroacoustics people, we are very in influential in telling NASA exactly how far to put the people. If you see the right slide here, right side, 130 decibels. This is how much load we wanted to have on, on anybody basically for a very short duration. So even the astronauts were getting only 130 dB. So from 193 dB to 130 dB is just 60 dB, but you know, it's don't forget it's, it's not a, just a linear number, okay? So basically, you know, every time 
uh, the sound uh, pressure doubles uh, for, uh, and when you have 6 dB increments basically. So it's very important to understand this part of the picture. So I gave you a perspective of why we cannot do the testing on the launch pad because of limitations. Then I said we can do a small scale structure on the launch pad, you know, which is the first time we did it in the history of NASA. Then we did some RFID testing. So what I'm trying to bring you to uh, a philosophy of what we call as uh, North Pole, South Pole thinking, or vice versa thinking, or uh, possibilities thinking. What, are, what else I can do? You know, th those are the things we need to make sure. Next slide. So basically, uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the conclusions from this RFID uh, sensor, uh, this was the state of the art technology those days because RFID was the first time we put it on the rocket launch pad. Uh, so again, I'm telling you, innovation is very important in, in this uh, business. So uh, innovation is very simple. Basically, you take a look at what is happening, uh, uh, you know, a particular screw or a bolt or a structure. And if it doesn't do your job, then you modify it. A good example would be uh, one of the uh, engineers uh, who was in America. His name is, I think, uh, Sedow, S-A-D-O-W. He saw people lifting suitcases on their heads and stuff like that. And then that you know, suitcase was put on a, a horse cart and they drove him to the his place, you know. He said, why can't we put uh, wheels on the suitcases, you know? Just simple observation like that, you know, made him a billionaire actually. So it is very important that when you walk around, when you see around, you know, open your eyes, keep your uh, ears open, see what is going on in real life. And you can take a small change, make a small change, you know, uh, in, in technology, and that would make you a lot of money. It's not about money. It's about how you help uh, the, the humanity, basically. Uh, if you go back to the history of uh, United Kingdom, there are 500 different types of hammers, you know, hammers I'm talking about, sold in, in London in the 1500s. You know, why would anybody need a 500 different types of hammers, tell me? Why? Because, you know, whoever, maybe Prathamesh made a hammer and I didn't like it, so I modified it to pull a nail or you know, I made it a big handle or something like that. Just like going back 100,000 years ago when mankind moved from Africa, you know, he wanted to kill an animal because of food, but he couldn't kill an animal uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, any tools. He didn't have tools. So he tied a big, uh, um, you know, what do you call stone to a rope, I mean, and then killed it. Or then he put a handle to the uh, stone and then tried to kill it. So this is how the technology changes, you know, maybe the stone didn't work. So then he had to come up with a new type of stone. So it's about geology. Next slide. So as I said, uh, you know, when you do possibilities thinking, you solve one problem, but the application can be for many, many areas. So this is one of the uh, very uh, toxic material we call the hypergols, monomethyl hydrazine nitrogen tetroxide. This is a kind of fuel we use uh, uh, on the right side, it's called COPV, composite ore uh, wrapped pressure vessel. These are hundreds of them in the space shuttle and on the, also on the station, uh, space station. Uh, these were highly toxic material. If you combine them, they don't need any igniter. They explode basically. And that's what is being used on this, was used being on the space shuttle when you wanted to maneuver the rocket. So the space shuttle had three types of fuel. One is the liquid, uh, oxygen, liquid hydrogen, like the James Bond fuel the solid rocket boosters. And then the third type was for orbital maneuvering and reaction control systems up in space, which is basically the, the monomethyl hydrazine nitrogen tetroxide. And you, they are very toxic. They are in the shuttle when we walk around, you breathe them, you die, you know. That's how dangerous they are. Next slide. So now we'll talk a little bit about the noise effects on payloads like Cassini. You know, a lot of payloads I sent like, uh, you know, uh, uh, on Hubble, maybe one, advanced uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer, uh, uh, Magellan, uh, you know, uh, Galileo to Jupiter, um, Cassini uh, to, to uh, Saturn, things like that. And these uh, are going for a long, long time, long distance probes. And you may get one time in your lifetime to work on these probes for 30 years maybe. And if you make a small mistake in launching and you, you don't do a good vibration testing, you are done because the mission failed. So. In the business of rocket launching, mission success is the most important thing. And that's where safety, systems engineering, 
understanding multidisciplinary knowledge of things are very very critical you know uh, if something fails we do the root cause analysis we understand the engineering of systems we put a lot of different types of people uh, multidisciplinary and then finally we document uh, the test results like columbia challenger uh, uh, so that we don't have another accident like that next slide so this is just a, a pictorial dip depiction of launch loads and flight loads. Next slide. Uh, what is important is, you know, uh, uh, this slide tells you exactly which part of the program you are involved in. I was involved in more like launch environment because I was a launch pad engineer. And if you're in, involved in space environment, you have other issues, planetary environment, like, you know, uh, go to many different planets. Uh, so each area is totally different. But the only easiest way is to simulate vibration, noise loads, uh, G loads, aerodynamic loads, uh, uh, thermal vacuum testing on the launch pad. So Cassini aircraft or your uh, Perseverance rover or Ingenuity helicopter, they were all tested in these kind of environments. Next slide. So here's just a breakdown of how many, many things are done. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much details, but just talk about a little bit about, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we are talking about extremely high levels of dynamic load with uh, sound and vibration. Uh, uh, static loads are being imposed by vibratory loads. Uh, we have acoustic loads on top uh, and then pyroshocks, like when you take the rocket up, the space shuttle and the solid rocket boosters are completely empty and they have to come off after two minutes. We use pyrotechnic initiators to break them off, you know, and they fall in the Atlantic Ocean, we bring them back. The external tank, the orange tank, which blows up in the atmosphere and burns up in the atmosphere after T plus eight minutes. And then last but not least, thermal environment, because each uh, uh, um, probe going to Mars will be totally different from probe going to, like, say, you know, um, you know, sun or something like that, you know. So uh, we have sent probes to sun, you know, uh, what kind of thermal shielding we need to have. You know, those are the questions we need to answer. Next slide. Uh, so what happens if you make a mistake? Simple mistake like this is a NOAA satellite. Somebody opened up the bolts and they were moving the rocket from one area to another area uh, for launching and it collapsed. $300 million gone there. Next slide. So this is a, a Genesis spacecraft. It was sent to collect solar wind, uh, wind samples. Uh, basically, it returned to Earth, but, uh, you know, crash landed because uh, the, the uh, parachute failed to deploy. Just like the ESA probe, which landed on Mars, you know, uh, I was in Denmark one time giving lecture and I talked to the guy, person who was in charge of the probes uh, and uh, ESA probe, Schiaparelli, and uh, everything was good. And, uh, you know, last minute, the, the parachute didn't open because... Yeah, it had a vibroacoustic problem at liftoff and that created a problem. So the entire mission, well, except for the orbiter, which is still taking data and giving help to Perseverance rover and all that, that's okay. I mean, it is, you know, we, we always work together in space. You know, that's the business of space, basically. And uh, so, but the mission to land Chaparelli a probe on, on, on Mars, uh, uh, you know, crash landed in the last minute. So hopes of many people get dashed. Next slide. Uh, this is a classic example of seven year mission. I was working uh, uh, with the uh, US Air Force people. They were launching rockets and they had done a lot of testing on this particular um, probe and rocket. This is a probe called Stardust, which is supposed to go to a comet and collect the dust from the comet and come back. It's a seven year project. And they were very afraid that the launch vibrations were going to be very high. The, what they forgot was that the whole liftoff sequence lasts for about less than 30 seconds, you know. But they had tested extreme, basically, in each axis of three axis, X, Y, Z axis, they tested for three minutes, as if the whole structure was going to experience three minutes of loading until max Q or maximum aerodynamic pressure. So it is very important to understand when you do the testing what the real life envir uh, uh, environment of uh, 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 you know, re what is the real life? What is the real situation? You know, if, if my structure is going to get only one minute of load, why am I testing it for 10 minutes? Maybe I can test for two minutes, three minutes, not 10 minutes, you know, so you're overkill in terms of testing. But in the business of space, 
test what you fly, fly what you test is the key, you know, uh, otherwise it's going to be a big, big problem. But what one cannot test is the vibroacoustics, you know, because we just cannot produce. The maximum we can produce right now in, uh, in uh, Ohio is about 163 decibels of sound. Uh, we still are 30 decibels uh, low, you know. Next slide. So this is a sample of uh, one of the acoustic uh, test chambers. You know, you, you in, in put about um, uh, uh, speakers and bombard these, uh, you know, bombard the uh, um, probe or, or uh, in this case satellite or whatever um, to, to different acoustic frequencies, ranges and stuff like that. But again, you're talking about 140 to 150 decibels. That's about it. Maximum 160 maybe, but not, not 190 dB. Next slide. So uh, this one is a vibration test. Again, you put it on a, uh, a, a vibration table and you measure the uh, you know, sound energy and then convert that into uh, uh, you know, a vibration energy. And then you apply the vibration to the table to simulate what's going on with the vibration of the structure. So this is again a simulated structure. It's not the real one. But that's what you have. That's what you get. So that's one of the reasons I'm telling you that this field is very, very hot field. Um, as youngsters coming up, uh, they always ask me, oh, I want to become an astronaut. Don't worry about being an astronaut. I'm happy that I was an astronaut maker. I learned more from launching rockets and being on the launch pad and working with astronauts than astronauts themselves. You know, So that's my opinion. Yes, they are much, much above us, but it's not about that. It's about uh, being satisfied with uh, what you do. I mean, 100 launches is not bad, you know. 700 almost astronauts to uh, space is not bad. Uh, uh, launching Hubble, uh, my first year in NASA is not bad. Uh, launching, uh, you know, a Galileo or uh, things like that, you know, or a Cassini or stuff like that. Magellan uh, to Venus, Galileo to Jupiter, uh, launching probes to Sun. Uh, so these are amazing, amazing opportunities, including Hubble, and then building the ISS, you know, so excellent. So in one of the, uh, I just want to uh, make it a little bit light here. So a lot of times, you know, there are complex problems in life which can be solved with simple things. There's always a crisis in life. There's a Chinese proverb for crisis. It says danger or opportunity. So remember we talked about after Kalpana Chawla's uh, accident in STS-107, we had a lot of foam falling from this orange tank. So we were very concerned about orange tank and making sure it's safe, you know. So one time, uh, uh, a mommy woodpecker and a daddy woodpecker, they wanted to have babies. And the mommy woodpecker told the daddy woodpecker, hey, go and find me a nice tree. We can have your babies, you know. So it went around the launch pad. As you see, there is nothing there except the ocean, no big trees. So it came to the orange tank and he said, hey, my wife may really like this uh, orange, you know, this tree. So it packed about 300 holes in the orange tank. So this was right after Columbia, a Kalpana Chavez accident. So they came to us and uh, said, you know, can we launch like this? I said, no way. And they said, it's going to be delayed. I said, okay, uh, what's the delay? $1 million per day. Okay, it moves back to the uh, off drawing board. So we sent it back to the VAB, the vehicle assembly building. We repatched everything. But we still had a problem because these woodpeckers were still running around. So how do you get rid of them? So NASA is under an environmentally controlled zone. I have 500 species of birds, animals, mammals, reptiles, and all that. It is impossible to kill anything there. So somebody said, oh, let's shoot the birds. You know, But if you shoot the birds, you may hit the rocket, <laughs> which is a bigger problem. you know. And we can't bring guns inside NASA. So the next thing was somebody said, OK, uh, why don't we uh, uh, catch a couple of woodpeckers. Uh, well, who's the predator for woodpecker? Uh, uh, and then they said, uh, uh, no, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm talking about, yeah, owls or uh, predators for woodpeckers. So somebody said, why don't we catch a couple of owls and send them after these woodpeckers? But that's also a no-no in NASA because it's not a dog to train a dog to do something. You know, you can't catch an owl and tell him to go after a woodpecker. You know, he may not want to do that. And it's again environmentally not right for environmentalists. So anyway, so finally some NASA engineer, NASA sends emails all over the world. This uh, one of the NASA engineers said, "Why don't we take balloons filled with uh, they put put them with helium and put a owl face on top of them and 
put it on the launch pad, which is 100 meters. So every 10 meters, we put one balloon all over the place. And even today, the last launch, we had uh, um, a balloon filled with helium and with the owl face and the birds ran away, you know. So amazing that a lot of times you have complex problems can be solved with simple, uh, uh, as, as Leonardo da Vinci would say, uh, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Next slide. So really uh, coming to sort of conclusion, um, so it's difficult to say what is impossible for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. So this is a very nice quote by Robert Goddard, you know, who's the father of American rocketry. Um, really, it's very important uh, that we, we strive to understand uh, the business of space and then make sure that, you know, we uh, contribute uh, adequately in whatever areas of expertise you want to go in, basically. Next slide. So let's uh, have some fun with the loudness records, the loudest animal sound. Uh, shuttle is about 190 decibels, as you know, uh, it's a blue whale underwater. So if there's a blue whale sitting in Los Angeles Harbor and its girlfriend is in Australia, it can talk underwater, basically. The loudest insect sound is the Australian uh, cicada. It, it, uh, it vibrates its uh, organs at a very high rate of almost 70 to 100 pulses per minute. And uh, you can detect it very uh, long. I've been to Australia many times and heard this. You can't sleep at night. Uh, noisiest animal is about a uh, howler monkey in South America. So this guy can detect it about three miles. Three miles is the distance from where the shuttle launch launches to, to, to where I am standing. So very interesting that, you know, everybody who is not a vibroacoustics engineer, uh, they look at the shuttle, the sound and the uh, light show. And as the shuttle lifts off, it's a tremendous, tremendous feeling. You should go to a Google uh, a YouTube site and put it on with a loud music, you know, uh, increase the volume. You will see the fury of the shuttle when it takes off and uh, everybody claps. We have a million people standing around the city uh, in Kennedy Space Center. They will all be clapping. But me as a vibroacoustics engineer, I wanted to make sure I passed that three mile, I mean, three minute mark. So I was uh, not saying anything until, you know, the low frequencies which are below 20 hertz, human ear cannot hear. Only 20 to 20,000 uh, hertz is what we can hear. So anyway, the bottom line is that, you know, the low frequencies will come about, take about 15 seconds and start vibrating my shirt. And that's when I would be happy because now the shuttle is safe. You know, that's what a uh, good vibroacoustics engineer would do. Next slide. Uh, some things about organ, you know, in New Jersey it produces 182 decibels, loudest scream, from somebody in Southwest Australia, 128 decibels. Loudest shout is about 122 decibels from Ireland. Loudest whistle, 122 decibels. Loudest snoring. So if boys and girls, if you want to get married, make sure you have a sound level meter to your uh, uh, you know, boy or girl to make sure that they don't snore before you get married. I'm just kidding. Next slide. <laughs> so I think that's about it. Come and visit us anytime at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, just uh, last uh, video, unfortunately, there's no sound, but uh, this would be a beautiful sound. Next slide. So this is the a small uh, one, uh, three minute video, or not even three, one minute video of uh, shuttle liftoff. And we are talking about 180 decibels. This is a tremendous, very powerful video when we play it in an auditorium. The whole auditorium vibrates basically, you know. So right now we are just lifting off main engines now we are coming back to the norm and then the solids are lift off. Once the solids are lift off, it just jumps. You see T0 and then all the umbilicans come on. See the solids are coming off now. And now it's Hail Mary. Nobody can stop the rocket. You know, it's like you're going somewhere. Either you're going to space or you're going to have a crash landing. So uh, the rocket is lifting off. Beautiful Atlantic Ocean uh, right in the back. Uh, um, and then, you know, you'll see the rocket lifting off, basically. So uh, just a few few words of, a uh, few comments here. Um, uh, next slide. Oh, yeah, I think we have the, that's the last slide, right? Is that right? Uh, yeah, yes, sir, yes. Okay, I just want to read off a few things for you. Um, you know, uh, um, well, really, um, just want to give you a 
quick rundown in five minutes and then we'll go to the question and answer. So uh, think, believe, dream and dare. You know, these are my messages. Uh, uh, almost, uh, if you don't dream, you're not gonna go anywhere and you keep on pursuing you know, uh, your dream. Uh, my life started in, uh, after I came back from Kabul in the 1964s, saw the Indian movie Sangam. I wanted to emulate being a pilot and, you know, uh, and uh, become a pilot so I can go around the world, marry a beautiful girl. Both happened, I never became a pilot, but it doesn't matter. Like Leonardo da Vinci said, you know, if I can't fly, let my uh, research and development of technology be for others. So if I didn't fly, I came, got to come to America and work on, started rail, railroads and mining and helicopters and commercial airplanes. Took me almost 20 years before, from 1975 to 1989, I joined NASA. And so basically uh, uh, in Boeing also, I worked on helicopters and commercial airplanes. In NASA, I worked on rockets to send people to space. So if I can become an astronaut, I, I'm okay with being an astronaut maker. So that is the small trigger which started way back in 1964. So to be the best in the world, uh, you have to have uh, the trait of leaders. You have to have very unique or unbridled creativity, radical passion, a uh, lot of curiosity and in inquisitiveness, uh, and insatiable appetite for learning, uh, unique problem solving skills, uh, think differently, a uh, lot of focus, and uh, basically tenacity. So, you know, STEM is very important because uh, as I said earlier, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, really uh, the, the, the uh, director of uh, JPL, he always said, scientists study the world as is, but engineers create the world which never was. So, you know, yes, you know, you can say scientists are designing things and they are checking things, but we, the engineers build the Hubble we launched it in space. We built Perseverance rover. We launched it in space and now it's going to fly a helicopter. 600 years ago um, or 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci started thinking about helicopters. In my career, I, in 1980s, I worked for Boeing. I worked on helicopters, the Chinooks, the tilt rotor, uh, Osprey. But now I'm seeing helicopter fly on Mars in the next month or so. And then I worked on the ISS program. But most importantly, I really, uh, uh, met, uh, you know, uh, Abdul Kalam uh, and Kalpana Chawla, you know, uh, separately. And uh, obviously I got, I was lucky to be one of the, you know, your journey, you never know the destination, you know the destination, but you, you don't know how to get there or how do you get there. And in the journey, anything can happen. So the, when I left Mumbai in a 75, I'd never thought that I would be coming to Kennedy Space Center and launching Kalpana Chawla. Then meeting uh, Dr. Kalam was one of the greatest things in my life. Uh, meeting Tenzin Norgay uh, in 73 also was a great thing because uh, Kalam and Tenzin, they said, okay, you have to find your own new Mount Everest, you know, maybe Olympus Mons on Mars. So you have to fly, or fly, you know, wherever you want, but, you know, don't uh, think of Everest anymore. It's been taken. So with that, uh, I want to leave you with one last thought. Uh, we built a hundred million dollar museum for Space Shuttle Atlantis. I want to tell you why, because it's very important in my life and career. My friend, uh, when I was standing on the launch pad, he took my picture. The same picture appeared in a book called Infinite Worlds. And then we built the museum. And then the curator of the museum asked Michael, uh, the author of the book, to send the best pictures. And that picture went to uh, uh, this museum. So hundred million dollar museum. Uh, and I was... Uh, I, I'm on the wall on the museum and, and uh, you know, right under the space shuttle Atlantis. And we didn't know that uh, Kalpana Chawla's memorial would be, you know, I would be overlooking that uh, opposite to where I, my picture was. So in the end, I just want to leave you with uh, uh, one thing. Uh, Self-esteem is the most important thing in your life. After talking to 700 astronauts, have no fear, take all the risks. How can the sky be limit when there's footprints on the moon? Uh, we have rover prints on the Mars, and I think we'll be flying, you know, uh, on the uh, helicopter in Mars. So reach for your own heights in your life, and just go for it, as Nike says. Good luck, and God bless you all. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, sir, for this amazing session. And I hope everyone has learned many things for, uh, regarding vibro acoustics as well as noise and vibrations. Uh, I guess we can take up some questions from chat section. Uh, yeah, we are ready, ready for the questions, yeah. Somebody is going to read the questions or how does it go? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking out for the questions here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, we're ready to go. Okay, um, so uh, we have some questions uh, here. Uh, keep my answer short so that we can answer many questions, okay? Yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Um, so the first question is, uh, what kind of software uh, was used by NASA to simulate uh, these noise and vibrations on space shuttle? Uh, really, there is no, no uh, software, but a uh, lot of work was done by CFD, computational fluid dynamics work. Uh, you saw that uh, accident of the Hubble STS-124 mission. You can go and read about it, uh, STS-124 mission. Uh, we spent millions of dollars on that. And the other one would be finite element structural analysis, where now nowadays you can take the raw data from uh, uh, a microphone or a accelerometer from the launch pad and convert that data into FFT uh, frequency domain from time domain to frequency domain and convert the data into PSD or power spectral density, where the power is or the, where the energy is coming from that rocket noise and take that uh, power spectral density and directly apply into a a structural math model you can generate from finite element uh, analysis. So those two would be the most important ones, CFD and FEA, finite element analysis. In the old days when we were working, we didn't have the luxury of all that basically. Next question. Yeah. Um, so we have one uh, question from the chat section uh, by Gurava uh, Savan Kumar. What are the main limitations of traditional FEM when it is when it comes to acoustic modeling? Uh, not much really, uh, except that we can test it, the, test the results basically. So testing the results are very important. I did a lot of uh, FEA analysis for Boeing helicopters and also at NASA. And a lot of times, you know, test is the main uh, driving force, you know. So uh, uh, I wrote a, a very good paper with one of my bosses and uh, the test kept on coming with the different numbers and FE came up with the different numbers. In the end, the test was right. So make sure that you validate your FE model. Next. Okay. Um, so uh, the question is: Back when when, uh, when the Apollo program was announced, uh, how did engineers tackle this problem of, of noise and uh, vibrations? As we didn't had such powerful computers to perform such kind of CFD analysis. They didn't because they just put water basically to mitigate uh, the sound. They tried in a small scale models. And then uh, they applied the same uh, sound, uh, I mean, the, the same uh, water system onto the bigger models, basically. So that is, that is where the problem came because when you start looking at uh, uh, Apollo was liquid oxygen, li kerosene engine, which was okay. It didn't create very high, what they call as ignition over pressure pulse, but uh, the shuttle had the solid rocket boosters. So when the exhaust comes out of the jet nozzle of the solid rocket booster, it comes at Mach 3, Mach 4. That is tremendous amount of ignition over pressure peaks in excess of 15 PSI, 14 PSI, or even it can go to about 80 PSI, 90 PSI, depending upon where you are, obviously. And these are, have to be mitigated and it's very hard to do that. So uh, they tested trial and error. And uh, as you saw in the STS-1 case when the shuttle got launched in 1981, we saw a big crack because they didn't understand the effect of solids. Next slide. Next one. Um, yeah. So, yeah. how can we prevent these vibrations of rocket for easy space travel? The best thing to do is uh, you uh, uh, do the uh, vibroacoustic analysis on the computer, uh, get the acoustic data, put the uh, PSD into the finite element math model of the structure, and then apply the loads and come up with a vibration profile and take that vibration profile and compare it to the other rockets 
which we have, we have done. I have personally done hundreds of spatial data. You can compare it to that rocket. So you know the thrust level and you can increase or decrease your vibration level and apply that level to the, uh, um, uh, uh, to the test, uh, this thing, you know, um, vibration table. And then you simulate that uh, uh, testing on the earth, you know, because in, in, uh, at liftoff, you have X, Y, Z vibration coming at the same time. Here, you have to modify with some kind of random vibration or doing testing at X, Y, Z directions, you know. That's how you simulate it. Next. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, are there any techniques of reducing or diverting a rocket liftoff noise? Impossible. 193 decibels, nobody can come up with that. Okay. The best um, is 133 dB. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why is it Im uh, important, important for us to explore space and how we are utilizing space technology on Earth? Yeah, uh, I think space, uh, all I, I want to say is, uh, you know, uh, many, many things. Uh, uh, space gives us an opportunity to understand, uh, look at Earth in a different way, like now on the ISS. ISS is a classic palace uh, in the sky, basically an Earth observation station, which is looking at the Earth every 90 minutes. It goes around the world in 90 minutes, 16 times a day and night. We were talking about, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, space uh, has many, many, many uh, technologies we can develop in space, um, you know, uh, from uh, uh, technologies such as like uh, GPS technology, internet technology, and, uh, you know, water purification, new medicines, testing uh, new, kinds of uh, disease management and things like that. So all these are very, very critical because uh, or even growing crystals, uh, uh, testing uh, new medication on mice. You know, where NASA's, spent, uh, my, myself has sent uh, mice, Japanese mice to space and stuff like that. Uh, so basically there is a tremendous amount of uh, uh, importance. So most important thing I would say is just uh, climate change would be the one, you know, looking at tsunamis, looking at uh, 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 problems all over the world and making sure the earth is safe, you know, for all the people of the earth. And communication technology. So mankind has always done two things, transport himself and communicate. So just take a look at internet technology. If tomorrow uh, asteroid or sun solar flare comes and hits all the satellites, you know, all, everything will shut off, you know, the, all the internet, everything will shut off. So basically, we have to protect all these things from space. So uh, going to space is very important just from educational standpoint, you know, and I think uh, uh, it inspires uh, great discoveries, just like we did hundreds of uh, uh, 100,000 years ago when mankind left Africa and what we did today. Uh, it improves health, radiation, cancer, bone loss, and uh, studying osteoporosis in space, uh, breast cancer, you know, many, many things. Uh, we really don't have to colonize space to learn all that. We can do it in low Earth orbit. But more we explore, maybe we are thinking that there is some minerals in some other part of the solar system which can benefit Earth, you know. So I think uh, in general, uh, that, that would be the um, big picture uh, understanding. You know, there are many, many, you can, uh, you know, ultrasound is one. I just had my ultrasound. Uh, done uh, testing done vaccine development improve air quality water quality eye surgery um, so basically these are these are uh, many many things one has to address you know and technologies which have really come around communication pro uh, things uh, food uh, development you know uh, uh, habitat issues uh, 3d printing technologies AR VR all these satellite technologies internet you know gps all this if you combine all that you know one uh, there's many many offshoots of technology which are creating additional opportunities for many people you know so uh in general i would say that uh, uh whatever technologies you develop as long as it benefits the mankind that's the way to go okay next yeah uh, um, some, some other things i can give you ex exact example ultraviolet protection these are something from NASA, new metal alloys, thermal blankets, lightweight composite materials, protein crystal development, smoke detectors, air purifications, firefighting 
solar power con uh, consumption, uh, infrared sensors, uh, CAT scans, computer tomography. Uh, as I said, you know, uh, there's hundreds of them on NASA site. You can go and check it out. But two most important thing is what does mankind do? You know, transport himself and communicate with others. So all the social media you are working with right now, in today right now, is because of that, you know, basically the internet and the communication systems. Next yeah. slide. Next one. Um, so we have now last two questions. Um, so uh, how does how, how are these vibrations were uh, nullified to keep the space shuttle structure intact? Uh, the only way uh, uh, we could uh, do these studies, understand where the problem was, like you know how fast the noise would travel, where the noise would travel. And uh, so we started making the structures more beefier and stuff like that. But more importantly, we also put some water bags right under the ro rocket booster so that when the uh, sound goes through water, it uh, cuts down the sound at left off. And then we also started putting 300,000 gallons of water. You saw that in the earlier video or, or picture. Um, uh, so those two were the ways. And then on the ground structures, we made sure that they were more, made more stronger. On the shuttle, we made sure that, you know, we had thermal blankets and other things, which made sure that uh, uh, the noise is, uh, the noise uh, uh, wants to go to the payload compartment. Like, you know, what happens if you are only 50, 100 feet above the uh, nozzle exit plane on the rocket, and that's where Hubble is sitting. Or 130 feet away, you have the astronaut sitting. So, as I said, rocket takes time to uh, noise uh, takes time to travel. So we beefed up that area, put more blankets, and we tested uh, Hubble and other uh, uh, probes much better. And uh, that's how you control the the uh, payload, you know, basically. Uh, and the astronauts, uh, they're lucky because the shuttle, as I told you, uh, it gives the pad very fast. So uh, 300 feet of uh, launch pad, you know, we take off within six seconds, you know, so the noise is trying to come down and it's deflected also. Uh, you saw the plane trench where I was standing. So when the plume comes, it hits a, like a V-shaped structure and it deflects 90 degrees on both sides. And so we take the acoustic energy and spread it out far away. So what happens is when you push it about 2,000, 3,000 feet, it takes more time for it to come and hit the rocket. At that time, we speed up the rocket quite a bit, meaning, you know, well, whatever the speed, six seconds, it leaves the tower, you know, which is a hundred uh, 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 meter tower, you know. So basically, that's how you do it. Yeah. Um, so the last question for the day is uh, by Heath Nayak. So where can we find any good content to study vibra acoustics? Um, what I would do, do is, uh, there are a lot of papers, uh, you know, we have written uh, on rocket noise and vibration. You can Google that. There is a one good paper. Uh, if you don't have it, I can uh, forward it to you. Uh, it's it's um, it was published by one of, one of my friends and I. Uh, all the work was done at Kennedy Space Center. This was in Chile. Uh, it's called Noise and Vibration of Spacecraft Structures. So if you can study that, that gives you a lot of information. It doesn't give you how to analyze the data and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, right now the technology is so matured that, as I said, uh, you know, any financial element program where you uh, design a structure, you know, has capability to apply the loads using, uh, you know, PSDs and other things. Uh, so if that's the way to go. Uh, and then you have to learn CFD, obviously. So um, those two are two uh, methods. MATLAB is another one. A good one so you can study all those and try to use it in your day-to-day -day activity or learn about vibroacoustics and uh, and read read quite a bit you know uh, unfortunately that the technology has not been documented well because of uh, its secret nature so if you look uh, there's a book by Bendat and Pearsall about vibroacoustics I think you can read about that uh, they, they came after us, but they were professors, so they wrote the book. So one of my friends in NASA, uh, he was sort of, I would say, the father of vibroacoustics, uh, who really understood vibroacoustics much, much more than anybody else. Um, 
uh, Valentin Sapchenko. Uh, he, he passed away many years ago. Um, he and I worked together in Boeing as well as NASA. So, uh, yeah, if, uh, if uh, th that would be, and then uh, study Ra NASA's website and Google some of the NASA websites. You should get a lot of material there. Um, basically, NASA, we wrote a lot of uh, studies, case studies. We call it uh, um, leadership uh, uh, notes, uh, like, you know, um, even the flame trench damage. You know, this is the one about uh, hitting the bricks, basically. This is the brick problem we faced on STS-124. So we have a lot of this information, you know, you can get it. Those, those are not uh, any secret or anything like that anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah. so th that's it, sir. Uh, we have covered up every question till here. Uh, I would like to thank and ex uh, extend our greetings from National Space Society, US in Mumbai chapter for taking out your time, valuable time, and uh, delivering this lecture. Uh, just want to close the uh, thing uh, with, with uh, just a few notes here. I just want to talk about it. Uh, you know, if you want to become one of uh, good, uh, you know, systems engineers, and I, I told you earlier, you know, if uh, you have to follow four logical things. One is, uh, you know, uh, find the root cause analysis, basically. Root cause is not same as the uh, uh, the real cause, mostly like Columbia Challenger, we call it the proximate cause, which is the failure of O-ring or uh, foam, foam hitting. But the real root cause was human error because uh, humans really did uh, uh, a problem. The management overruled what they call as uh, a deviation of the norm, you know, normalization of deviance. So, you know, understand what, where the root cause of the problem is and then have a very good engineering curiosity. Um, I, you know, I said understanding the systems, systems engineering uh, is very, very important. Um, then you have to have a good communication skills, uh, both written and verbal. And then uh, most importantly, have multidisciplinary knowledge. You know, maybe building a car, but make sure that you understand all other aspects of the car on what all it does and how it affects your engine. Maybe, maybe you're an expert in engine, but you have to understand how the car is put together, you know. And last but not least, uh, you have to document what you're doing and make sure that other people don't make the same mistake. You know, so I think with that, I think uh, that we can conclude. Uh, let me see if I have one quote uh, here. I can, uh, yeah, I think, uh, the caterpillar, which is, uh, uh, which comes out of the cocoon, he never knew that he'll be a beautiful butterfly. So all the people, all this audience, you know, they're all beautiful butterfly, but they don't know that. So they have to put in their effort and become a beautiful butterfly uh, by following this uh, method here. Basically. Okay, good luck. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for the, all the inspirational messages and all the uh, knowledge that you have provided in today's session. I hope everyone has enjoyed this session, and uh, we will be uh, like we will be putting up these recordings on our YouTube channel too. So don't forget to subscribe as well as uh, let us know in the comment section, uh, and do follow us on our social media platforms too. Thank you so much sir, for your time. Okay. Good luck and uh, Godspeed, as we say in NASA. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Have a have a nice day, sir. So.